All right, we were looking at Galatians chapter 1. Uh, we looked at Paul's claim that he received the gospel directly from Jesus Christ. And um, so he starts talking about how he was one of the chief Judaizers and how it was very, very important to him personally to spread the Judaism, uh, the Jewish faith among people. And he says he was extremely zealous for it uh, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 14. The word that is you that he uses for himself over there, you know, the Greek word for zealous, which he uses for himself over there, that is similar to the word that is used regarding Jesus and the zeal which he had for God's house. You know, in John chapter 2, verse 17, um, it says, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the word which the Greek word which talks about Jesus zeal, and then the, the zeal which Paul is talking about over here in Galatians uh, 1.14. Those two words come from uh, the Greek word zelu, which talks about a deep sense of possessiveness. So Jesus felt very possessive about the house of God. That was his dad's house. You know, that was his father's house. And he wanted that house to be honored. And so he says, how can you turn my father's house into a den of thieves. So he he feels very personally about the house of God. Uh, he is very zealous for it. Now, Paul felt the same regarding the Jewish faith, uh, the regarding the teachings of Moses, regarding the traditions which had been passed down to them uh, you know, over the ages. He felt very possessive about it, and he believed in it. So when this... Um, new community of Christians began to talk about Jesus and what he had taught them. And they began to say, the old covenant is no longer applicable. Now we are in the new covenant. Now we are under Christ. Uh, it, was, it was a very uh, terrible thing for Paul to hear because he was uh, somebody who was extremely zealous for the traditions of his fathers. He, he is somebody who had been brought up in the Jewish faith. And so he uh, felt that this small new community of believers are um, desecrating something very, very precious. And uh, so uh, we do not know what exactly his employment was. I mean, he was a tent maker, uh, whether he was involved in other forms of you know, um, uh, activities, we are not sure. But he sets aside all of his work, and he literally starts going from town to town um, uh, arresting these believers because he wants to wipe out this teaching which they are bringing up because he feels so possessive about the traditions that have been passed down to him. So for a Judaizer like this to pull away from what he believed in and to start talking about a new gospel, it literally had to take a revelation of Jesus Christ himself. So he's, that is why he says, I was not sent by man. I was not commissioned off by a bunch of people and sent out to preach. You see, I had an encounter with directly with Jesus Christ, and he showed me that he has not come to, uh, to break the old covenant, but rather to fulfill it, to complete it. See, Jesus does not, does not just discard the old, uh, old Testament and the old covenant. Um, he, in fact, fulfills every law of the old covenant. Humans were not able to do that. Even though the Israelites were very proud of the covenant, they never could keep it. Only one person was able to keep that old covenant completely, and that was Jesus. And he did it as our representative because we were all helpless to do that. The Jewish community was helpless to do it. And so Jesus becomes the one representative who successfully was able to complete the old covenant fulfill the old covenant, and then he introduces a new covenant. So when Paul has his encounter with this Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ personally gives him this new revelation that the old has been completed and fulfilled. And now, because the old has been completed, now the people who come to God will accept the new covenant which Jesus has started through the cross, through the work of the cross. So. 
this is the argument which he is trying to build and uh, uh, so he says in verse 15 and verse 16 um okay verse 15 16 17 if someone could read out from verse 15 up to verse 20 please galatians 1 uh, 15 to 20 if someone could read out we who are Jews by nature are not sinners by of Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith in Jesus hey, Christ. No, I'm so sorry, but I think you might have got the wrong uh, verses. Galatians 1, uh, Galatians 1, 15 to 20. Go ahead. But when it Galatians pleased God, who, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with blood, with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But when I but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. For now, concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not lie. Amen. Amen. So he says, um, I, a Judaizer, who was so zealous for the Jew Jewish traditions, now, after my encounter with uh, with jesus christ he says god has now revealed his son in me is what he says in verse 16. so um he is changed by his encounter with jesus christ now jesus christ is revealed in him in 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 the way he, he has a completely new perspective in the things which he is preaching now in the things that he is now standing up for and so this is something that has come out from his uh, from his encounter with jesus and it's not just something that he has received from men and and he goes on to say once i had this encounter with jesus once jesus christ was revealed in me and i got to know the truth he says my immediate response was not to consult any human being so he didn't go running off to jerusalem and ask the people hey you know what i had this encounter with jesus and he said these things to me uh, is it correct I mean, have I understood it correctly? Uh, should I, you know, modify what uh, what he said in any in any manner? He doesn't do any of that. His immediate response is not to consult any human, because he just accepts word for word whatever Jesus has said to him, and he, um, you know, uh, accepts it as the absolute truth, as the one and only good news as the one and only gospel. So he says, I never went to any human and consulted with them regarding this revelation which I have received. Instead, what did I do? Um, yeah, in verse 17, he says, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. And um, then he says in verse 18, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. Now, we get a clearer picture regarding uh, the, the activities of Paul immediately after his encounter with Jesus in um, Acts chapter 9. If we were to go to Acts chapter 9 and look at verse 17 and, you know, there onwards, uh, we get a clearer picture of what happened. Uh, so um, uh, he has this encounter with Jesus in um, verses 15, 16, and all of that. Then, you know, he's blinded. Uh, then uh, Ananias comes and ministers to him in uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 18. So then the scales fall from his eyes. He's able to see again. He gets baptized. So now he is baptized into the new covenant, you know, as a, as a follower of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 19, we get to know that he spent several days with these disciples, with the people, you know, the believers in Damascus. So it was probably maybe one week, two weeks that he spends with them. And verse 20 says, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the son of God. 
So he didn't go and consult any humans and ask them, oh, you know, this, this message which I have received from Jesus, is it accurate? Should I believe in it? No. He just accepts it uh, directly from the Lord as the truth. And at once, it says in 920, Acts 920, at once he begins to preach it in all the synagogues. And he preaches it so powerfully that people start accepting Jesus Christ as savior. And the Jews are very, very upset about it. And they uh, decide that they're going to kill him. And so in Acts chapter 9, verse 23, we read about the conspiracy that is kind of hatched up against him, uh, you know, where they decide that uh, they're going to kill him. And then the other believers, they come to his rescue. So in Acts chapter 9, verse 25, uh, they lower him down in a basket through an opening in the wall, and he is able to make his escape. That is when he basically goes to Arabia. So he goes into the Arabian desert for a little while. Uh, we don't know whether it was for uh, maybe two, three weeks, whether, whether it was uh, for more than a month. We do not know how long he hid over there. But then after hiding over there, he comes back to Damascus, and he continues to preach. So there's, there's this wrong idea that some people have, which I know they they, they say that um, that Paul, after his encounter with Jesus, he goes into the Arabian desert and then at, over there, God gives him the gospel message and teaches him those things. That is not the truth. If you look over here in uh, Galatians, what, whatever he says in Galatians chapter 1, and you compare it with what is said in Acts chapter 9, we get to know that within one or two weeks after his encounter, he immediately starts preaching. He does not go to Arabia. He immediately starts preaching in the synagogues. Then the persecution against him begins. Then the followers help him to escape. Then for a little while, he goes to Arabia. He hides over there in the desert. And he says, later I return back to Damascus and he continued to do his preaching ministry. So he continues doing this preaching ministry of the true gospel for three entire years. After three years, that is when he goes to Jerusalem. And when he goes over there to Jerusalem, um, he meets with only uh, Peter and James. He doesn't even, in fact, meet all the other disciples. So um, then uh, he, he explains in verse 21, Galatians 1, 21, he says, then I went to Syria and Cilicia. So after having uh, spent a little time with Peter and James uh, in Jerusalem, he from there, he goes to Syria and Cilicia and does ministry over there. And then 14 years later, he again goes back to Jerusalem. And uh, the reason that he's saying all of this in such great detail is that he wants to explain to the believers for 14 years, he has been teaching a gospel which has not come from some other human party. It is, some, it is something that has come to him directly from Jesus Christ itself. And that led to a lot of conversions. Many people came into the fold. Many lives were changed. So he's, the point that he's making is, is this true gospel has power in it. Hold on to it. It has changed lives for 14 years, and it will continue to do that. So do not doubt what I have presented to you. No, do not uh, listen to these Judaizers who may be saying to you, oh, this man was not one of the original disciples of Jesus. So maybe he's got it all wrong. Maybe he didn't get the correct training which he should have received from Jesus. So if people are saying those things to you, they are mistaken. And so he wants it established that his gospel is true, something which can be trusted and something which can be accepted. So uh, he takes that many verses, that many, you know, that much time to explain all of this because it is important that they should not just um, ignore all that has been taught to them. Uh, so um, in chapter two is when uh, he, you know, he he talks about how fourteen years later he goes to Jerusalem, um, and uh, let's look at some of the things which he says at that time. 
Uh, so chapter two, if we could have someone read out for us the first five verses, please. Um, chapter two, verses one to five. Then after, then 14, after 14 years, I went up again in Jerusalem with Barabbas and... Please continue. Yeah, please go ahead. Brother Collins, I think you got muted. Then after 15... 14 years, I went up again in Jerusalem with <laughs> Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Then after 14 years, I went up again in Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took writers with us. I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation list by any means I might run, or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But this occurred because of false brethren, secretary brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To whom? we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Amen. Amen. So he explains to them and he says, so you see for 14 years I have preached this gospel and um, uh, it, it, you know he has the backing of Jesus Christ for all of these 14 years. The gospel which he has preached has been backed up by God himself and you know they have they have they have seen uh, the 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 fruit of it they have seen the results of it so now in the 14th year the only reason he goes to consult with the uh, with the with the disciples of Jesus you know with the apostles who are there in Jerusalem he goes because a revelation was given to him by God he says that in verse 2 chapter 2 verse 2 he says a revelation is given to him um, maybe maybe God reveals to him that uh, Paul's teachings have been, have been creeping in and he needs to go and talk about this with the leadership in Jerusalem. So basically, in obedience to that, he goes to uh, Jerusalem along with Barnabas and Titus. Um, basically, because uh, Barnabas uh, can, can be like a go-between, you know, like a mediator between him and the apostles. And he takes Titus along because Titus is a Gentile who is now in leadership. He's a Gentile believer who is a uh, leader uh, over all the churches in the entire Cretan region. Right. So along with these two persons, he goes and has a private meeting with the apostles in Jerusalem. And so at that time, they discuss about they they you know among themselves they discuss this false teaching which is coming up, and um, he says in verse two, I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised. So he says, for fourteen years, I didn't ask for any human affirmation. I just spoke out boldly whatever Jesus Christ had told me to speak out and without any human support I just went ahead and did it after 14 years I went to the apostles and I told them this is what I have been preaching and the race which I have been running is not in vain uh, because um, uh, you know it, it has been given to me by Christ and they affirm what he has been preaching all along and they say yes what you have been preaching is definitely correct and so they do not you know, demand that Titus, uh, uh, a Gentile believer, needs to be circumcised. They don't impose that Mosaic law upon him. So he says, even they, the apostles, after 14 years, when I went to them and had a discussion with them, even they didn't pressurize. Even they, they, they didn't ask Titus to be uh, circumcised and to follow the um, law of Moses. Uh, so he says in verse 4, 
this matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks so they are the ones who wanted to make us once again slaves of the mosaic law but we are actually free and the truth of the gospel has been preserved um so um let us look at verses 6 to 10 and see what he says over here uh, verses 6 to 10 if we can have someone read out please verse 6 but from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship, to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember they desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. Amen. So now the second point that he is making is that um, I preached for 14 years uh, with, the, with just the backing of Jesus Christ. And now after 14 years, when I came to the apostles, they also affirmed what I had been teaching. They, in fact, did not even ask Titus to, to obey the Mosaic law. And... Uh, they were, in fact, very, very happy to see. They recognized, he says in verse 7, they recognized that my calling was for the Gentiles, whereas Peter's calling was for the uh, Jewish community. And uh, so they accepted this. And uh, he says in verse 9, you know, the main leaders of the Jerusalem church, James and Peter and John, these people, they, you know, they extend a right hand of fellowship. And they recognize that you know uh, the the ministry which I have been given by Jesus Christ. So the point that he's making to the Galatian believers is that it's not just me, um, you know, who is saying these things. Even the Jerusalem leadership agrees with what I am saying. So um, he wants them to be uh, very assured about the gospel that has been presented to them. And after having said that, he moves on into his third point um, where he says verse 6 as for those who were held in high esteem whatever they were makes no difference to me God does not show favoritism they added nothing to my message the point he's making here is that yes these Jerusalem leaders were apostles um, they were um, direct disciples of Jesus. They had been personally trained by him. So they are people who are held in high esteem. But whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. It's not like as if God treated me in an inferior way and revealed less to me. No. Whatever he had revealed to them, whatever training he had given them, the same revelation, the same training was given even to me. So therefore, therefore, he says, they added nothing to my message. It's not like as if I learned anything extra from them after talking to them after 14 years. Nothing new got added. Whatever they had been told originally by Jesus, the same things were also told to me You know, when I had my encounter. So he says, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. He is so confident about his calling. He is so confident about what uh, God has asked him to do, and he is comfortable doing it. Now, this is an important point to keep in mind because you know he's going to talk about something else next, and that brings out the importance of what he is saying. Let's look at that, and then you know we can um, uh, look at the overall uh, teaching that we can take away from here. So let's look at verses 11, 12, and 13. If someone could read out 11, 12, and 13. Galatians 1, uh, Galatians 2, sorry, Galatians 2, 11, 12, and 13.
Now, yeah. when Peter uh, comes and yeah, Zelitoli, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Now, when Peter uh, had come to Antioch, I sent him to his face because he was to be blamed. For uh, for before certain men uh, came from Jesus, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, praying those who were of his circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their yeah. So if you remember just a little before in one of the earlier verses, he said those people, those apostles are held in high esteem because they were directly trained by Jesus Christ. But that doesn't make any difference to me in because God is not a God who shows partiality is what he says. So he says they did not add anything extra to my message. And in fact, this is what happened, he says. So he talks about this event, this incident when Peter came to visit Antioch. So uh, when um, Peter came to Antioch, um, in the beginning, he was very free with all the Gentile believers. He mingled with them, you know, sat with them, ate with them, had fellowship with them. He did not treat them inferior in, in any way because that's what had been revealed to him on the on the rooftop, right? I mean, when he had his uh, uh, vision from the Lord and God said, what I have declared clean, don't you dare call it unclean. So using that, um, uh, you know, that example of the unclean and clean animals, Jesus, uh, you know, says to him, I have declared the Gentiles also who come to me as clean. So now onwards, you will have to regard them as clean as well. So. Peter, who has understood this, when he comes to Antioch originally, he's very comfortable with the Gentiles. In fact, now he's not even following any of the Jewish um, you know, uh, ceremonial rituals. Uh, so I'm sure if the Gentiles were to place pork in front of him, he would have absolutely no problem eating the pork. Because now he's very much like a Gentile. You know, he is now under the new covenant. He does not feel any need to follow the old mosaic rituals. That is the way. Peter was living. But then you have some important Judaizers coming from Jerusalem to visit over here. So once they come, he starts kind of withdrawing from the Gentile believers. He no longer sits with them. He no longer eats what they are eating. Because you know, if you sit at their table, you'll have to eat what they are eating. And now he's, hesitate, he's hesitating. He's afraid what these Judaizers will say you know, if he starts eating the unclean foods, which are the technically unclean foods, which, you know, which uh, because the Jews still regard them as unclean. So he's afraid what the reaction would be if he were to eat those. So he starts distancing himself from the Gentile believers. So the people who are watching are now getting confused. Up to now, he was so friendly with everyone. And now he's kind of pulling away from them. Why? Because he is little worried about what these Judaizers are, uh, Judaizers are going to think. So now the crowd is wondering, maybe the Judaizers are correct in what they are saying. Because when Peter is now starting to act like them, he's also not you know, um, touching any of the, um, uh, the Jewish unclean foods. So they are wondering what's going on. And the event it unfolds in such a way and matters become so serious that even barnabas starts getting doubts that's what it says in verse 13. he says the other jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy even barnabas was led astray so imagine the true gospel had been presented to peter and peter had received a revelation on the rooftop he knew that um the grace of Jesus Christ alone is enough for salvation. You don't need to follow any of the Mosaic laws. But once these very powerful, influential people showed up, he was afraid. He was afraid of what they would think. He was afraid of having to debate with them. So he tried to just avoid the believers. In a way, what he was doing is he was turning his back on the truth. And this is what... Um, Paul says, verse 14, um, yeah, if you could, you know, read out uh, 14, 15, 16, 
Yeah, if you if someone could read out verses 14, 15, and 16, please. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So when Peter starts acting like this, and then all the other Jewish believers start you know, imitating him, so they also start avoiding the Gentile believers. Uh, now, I'm sure this entire thing would have happened in the setting of the, you know, community meals which they used to have, uh, which was basically their version of uh, the Lord's Supper. I mean, now we just have a wafer and we have some uh, grape juice. But then back then, they would have an actual entire meal. So they would all sit together. Um, it was more like a potluck uh, dinner, you know, because different people would bring different foods. And then they would all sit together and they would share in the meal. And uh, so the food items which they are um, eating, are, an, are a representation of the body of Jesus Christ. And so through that one body of Jesus Christ, through that one sacrifice which he made, they have now all been brought into the family of God and they are all together, one family, no longer divided, you know, because that's basically what the bread, or uh, Jesus the bread represents. We feed on him. We all have been brought into the uh, kingdom of God through him by feeding on his flesh, by drinking his blood, you know, in that symbolic sense. So this is what the communal meal, which they all used to share, represented. It represented the unity that was there among them as one single community that has been brought together by Christ. And now here you have important main leaders going against this basic fundamental truth. So when they're all gathering together, no longer are the Jewish believers willing to sit with the Gentile believers. They're maintaining their distance. And whatever food the Gentile believers are cooking and bringing over here, the Jewish believers are now hesitant to go and eat that. Because you know, they're, now, they're wondering, the Judaizers are watching us. These are very powerful, influential men. What will they think if I go and eat that? So there's a division which has happened. And Peter himself has initiated this through his conduct. Peter never stood up and preached any sermon. He never opened his mouth and said, uh, you know, okay, this is the true gospel, but then, you know, when people are powerful enough, maybe you should just compromise a little bit. He didn't say any of those things, but his actions spoke louder than words. Just through his actions, he was preaching that it's okay to compromise on the true gospel. And the, it says the Jews began to imitate him to an extent where even Barnabas began, became confused. So Peter, um, um, Paul takes a stand and he says in front of all of them, he says, you know, he says to Peter, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile. Once God told you that you should, you know, eat all animals, you stopped following the Mosaic law. You began to eat everything. You began to live the way, you know, the other Gentile believers are living. You stopped following all the ceremonies. So now, why are you forcing the, Jew, the, the Gentile believers to become circumcised and you know um, imitate the, the Jewish customs through your actions? Though he has not said anything in words, through his actions, he's now siding with the Judaizers. So he says, how? Um, so Paul says to Peter, how is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Even though Peter has not stood up and openly said, from now on, you people should be circumcised. His actions seem to be indicating that he is supporting the Judaizers. So Paul says it's, it's almost like as if, you know, indirectly, without even using words, you are forcing these Gentile believers to start becoming like the Judaizers. How can you do such a thing? And he goes on to say, we who are Jews by birth, even we have now realized that justification is gone, not going to come to us through the Mosaic law. It's only going to come to us through 
faith in Christ Jesus. He says that in verse 16. Therefore, because you know we can only be justified through faith in Jesus Christ, how can we go back to the works of the law? So he's explaining these things to the Galatian congregation and he's telling them, um, because of the authority that was given to me by Jesus Christ, because of the revelation that was given to me by Jesus Christ, I'm not even scared of the other important leaders, whether they are Judaizers or whether they are believers you know, of the true church. I'm not scared of any of them because I know the truth that has been given to me and I've decided to take a stand for it. Now, this is an important learning for those of us who are in ministry. So when we see important, famous people preaching something wrong, do we you know, just be quiet? And by being quiet, are we sending out a wrong message to our own people saying, ah, yeah, it's all right to compromise? Or do we speak up like uh, Paul and say, brother, what you're teaching is wrong. You are misleading the people of God. So the teaching that we can gain from, you know, from this passage is that, like Paul, just because the other leaders have held in high esteem, we should not hesitate. But rather, like Paul, we should uh, confront that. Because the important issue over here is the safety of the church, the people of God. The shepherds are supposed to guard them, protect them from harm. So if the leader does not take a stand and say, no, this is wrong, and I will not allow my sheep to be led away, it's a very dangerous thing. You know, the sheep can be uh, can be harmed by the by the by these high esteemed leaders who are leading them in the wrong direction. So the le learning that we gain from this passage is that um, even if important influential people start teaching something wrong, we should immediately take a stand for the protection of the sheep and declare in front of everyone and say, this is a wrong teaching. And then that way, the truth of the gospel is preserved and the, uh, the, the sheep are not led away into wrong things. Because what was happening here is, if, you, if, these, if, the, if the Gentile believers were to start following the Mosaic law, they would become slaves of the law. Jesus Christ came to set us free so that we would be free in him. We would no longer be slaves of the law or slaves of sin. Whereas this wrong teaching is going to lead them into slavery. So which is why uh, you know Paul takes a very strong stand against it. Um, if we were to look at verses uh, 17 up to verse 21. If someone could read out for us verses 17 to 21, please. Chapter 2, verses 17 to 21. Verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the Lord died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Okay, so um, he goes on to make one additional point over here in verse 17 onwards. He's, um, you know, just to put it in normal, simple words, um, he, he's basically saying those who are Christ followers, we also commit sin sometimes, right? I mean, we have not become perfect. We are still being sanctified on a daily basis. So those who are believers, they also sin. But does this mean that Christ is promoting sinfulness? Because you see, the argument which the Judaizers would have been making is this. They would be saying, you people are saying that you're followers of Christ. You people are saying that you now you're under a new covenant. But when we look at you, we see you making mistakes. You also sin sometimes. 
on the other hand if you had the mosaic law then maybe that would help you to stay on the right path so just accepting christ and becoming a follower of christ has not made you perfect on the other hand if you had even the mosaic law also along with your faith in christ then maybe you would be able to stay on the right path so uh is christ promoting sin by saying you know you should not follow the mosaic law anymore that's the argument which the judaizers are introducing they are indirectly saying by this christ of yours when he says that you should no longer follow the old covenant is he promoting sin by making you you know um live in any way that you want so paul says here absolutely not there is uh, the, the 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 right teaching is that you should avoid sin but to avoid sin it is not by you know introducing reintroducing a new set of laws and saying you shall do this 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 following christ and being obedient to christ um does not come by keeping a set of laws because if you reintroduce the laws once again you actually become a law breaker because the law of christ says you shall not follow the mosaic law so if you reintroduce the mosaic law in the hope of keeping the law you would actually not be keeping the law you would be breaking the law because christ has declared that the old covenant is fulfilled and closed and a new covenant has been introduced so if you were to reintroduce the mosaic law rather than keeping the law you would end up breaking the law of christ so he says yes we should avoid sin but avoiding sin is not done by keeping a set of laws rather it is uh, by living in christ so in verse 20 he says we have you know i have been crucified with christ and i no longer live but christ lives in me so this christ who now lives in me he will enable me to start uh, sanctifying myself on a daily basis he will help me to start living in a new and righteous way it's going to happen through his enabling it is going to happen through his work of grace i will not try to improve and become a better person by going back to the mosaic law and becoming a law breaker rather i will hold on to christ place my faith in christ so he says in verse 20 i live by faith in the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me so my my spiritual growth my level of um, uh, improvement on a daily basis it's not going to come through the law it's not going to come through the mosaic law never it is only going to come by living in in faith in jesus christ i look to him i will depend on him i will believe that his grace is sufficient to change and transform me and even as i continue to walk in him he will do his work in me because i was crucified the old person that i was was crucified and is gone now the person that i am uh, is somebody who literally has christ living in him i mean in me so therefore i will be able to follow um, you know the 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 right the righteousness which god expects through the enabling of jesus christ so this is the point that he makes so um so he is going against the argument which was made by the judaizers who said christ is promoting sinfulness by taking the law away no christ is not promoting sinfulness christ has the power and the ability uh, to change us and transform us if we place our faith in him because now he is living in us we were crucified to the law we were crucified to the old covenant we were crucified to those things we no longer need to depend on them we now have christ himself he will enable us to walk in a new way so the assurance that he is giving over here to the galatian congregation is that don't worry it's true that you want to live holy lives but you don't need to go back to the law to be able to live holy lives it's going to happen by placing your faith in christ by keeping your focus on him and depending on him so the next chapter was 3 uh, chapter 3 onwards he goes on to talk about those details about how you can grow in god how you can grow in righteousness by continuing to hold on to christ not by going back to the law but by walking ahead walking forward with christ hand in hand 
so we will talk about those things from chapter 3 onwards uh, so chapter 1 and 2 was mainly a very lengthy introduction a defense which he offered so that the galatian believers will start taking him seriously chapter 3 onwards he starts explaining how you can walk with christ in righteousness and how this is all a work of faith it's it's a work of grace it's got nothing to do with following law and uh, mosaic law and keeping uh, ceremonies and rituals okay so those are all the things which uh, he will be explaining to us the next chapter onwards all right um let's just close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much that um we don't have to be slaves of any uh, rules and regulations which we are unable to follow rather oh lord we live by faith you are the one who does your divine work in us you're the one who uh, convicts us. You're the one who causes us to change. You're the one who helps us to, um, to follow you. And Lord, through you, we are able to walk in newness of life, in righteousness. So, oh Lord, we don't need to uh, be like the Judaizers who felt that they had to follow a lot of ceremonies and rituals and regulations uh, to become a changed people. We can instead rest in you just abide in you. Just listen to your voice, follow your guidance, and see ourselves being changed automatically because the fruit of the Spirit starts getting formed in us even as we just follow you. We don't have to be um, uh, followers of the Mosaic law. We thank you for that freedom which we enjoy in you, O Lord. Even as we go into the third chapter, next class onwards, we pray, O Lord, that you would... Um, Teach us these truths deep in our spirit so that we can become genuine followers of Christ. Thank you, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And I do give my word. Your issues will be resolved. The admin will take care of it. Please do you know, write them a detailed email uh, you know, um, expressing your uh, thoughts. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Boston. Thank you.